Hello and welcome all to Homestead National Historical Park. We want to invite and welcome everybody who is here, but we also want to welcome everybody who is here uh, via the Eventbrite link. Um, we're so grateful to have you here today. As many of you know, Homestead National Historical Park is here to remember the many legacies of the Homestead Act of 1862, including the impact on immigration. You did not have to be an American citizen to start that homesteading process. You declared your intention to become one. We're so excited to work with our partners today um, who are uh, co-sponsoring this event with us. We have the, uh, the Nathan and Hannah Schwab Center for Israel and Jewish Studies at the University of Nebraska Omaha. Their mission is to create, coordinate, and promote into interdisciplinary programming focused on teaching and scholarship in Israel studies, Jewish studies, and the history, politics, cultures, and societies of the Middle East. And we're also Um, we remember all of those different legacies, all the different people that were impacted by the Homestead Act. So we're going to introduce, we're going to start with having an introduction on our online forum. Unfortunately, we won't be able to hear the in-person forum, um, but we will have Jeanette, uh, Dr. Jeanette Gabriel introduce uh, our talk today. Um, Dr. Gabriel is the director of the Schwab Center for Israel and Jewish Studies. Um, Dr. Gabriel's work is related to American history and religion with an emphasis on issues of race and gender. She employed oral history research methodology to document untold stories and complicate and enrich the existing historical record. Dr. Gabriel's oh. teaching and research interests focus on African American and Jewish collaboration and conflict and the Jewish history of the Midwest. And so I will now welcome Dr. Gabriel to our online forum. It will be just a moment, a few minutes until we get back to our live presentation. Thank you very much, Amber. The Schwab Center is pleased to be a co-sponsor on this important um, uh, forum today, examining Jewish homesteading. There has been quite a bit of research on Jewish homesteading over the years, but due to the nature of how Jewish homesteading took place, that research has been piecemeal. So we have uh, a lot of thorough documentation of different Jewish homesteading sites, and yet a lack of a comprehensive view of what Jewish homesteading looked like as a whole. Jewish homesteading began as a project as early as the 1820s, and there was a small amount of Jewish homesteading between the 1820s through the 1860s, but it began on a much larger scale in the 1870s with interest in the Homestead Act and the resettlement of recent Russian Jewish immigrants out into the plains. So to give you a comprehensive view, there were dozens of Jewish homesteading colonies in Virginia, New Jersey, Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, Kansas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Michigan. So this was really in many ways a national project. What's particularly interesting about the way that Jewish homesteading unfolded. Guys in my life that have opened up. Okay, can I ask people to mute themselves because we're we're hearing conversations. Um, so the way that uh, Jewish homesteading took place is that it began with local organizations, such as in Cincinnati, the Reform Jewish Community uh, with the Immigrant Aid Committee and um, the Chicago-based Jewish Agriculturalist Aid Society. Uh, local Jewish communities began to fund the settlements of, of Jewish colonies. Um, in Kansas and North Dakota, uh, these early settlements, it was even um, an early settlement in the 1870s from Cincinnati into Nebraska. These early settlements um, then uh, gave rise to significant national interest and there were really two sorts of national um, structures that were funding 
Jewish homesteading. There was the Baron den Hirsch colonies, and there was the also uh, a group of Jews out of the Southwest Ukraine called Amalam or the Eternal People, which was interested in the notion of auto emancipation, which was an idea promoted by Leon Pinsker. These settlements, and today we're going to be looking particularly at North Dakota, were for the most part largely unsuccessful, even though they received significant loans and uh, support from the national Jewish community. And there are many theories and speculations, examinations into why they did not succeed. Uh, a lot of it looks at the lack of knowledge and interest in recent Russian Jewish immigrants in farming, the drought conditions that people faced, uh, the isolation, the physical isolation out on the prairie and on the colonies. Um, <clears throat> but what's particularly interesting is that when we look at the colonies where people did succeed, where they had homestead settlements through government land, and they did succeed for a period of five years so that they were actually able to get title to the 160 acres of land. Then in those cases, the Jewish homesteaders very often quickly turned their land, sold their land and turned it into capital. And the reason that this was done was because the capital that they could take out of the land by selling it to larger agriculturalists enabled them to start businesses and to move back to urban Jewish enclaves and be part of broader communities. So we can look at sort of the history of Jewish homesteading as a failure in the sense that these colonies did not survive. On the other hand, there is the other point of view of looking at it, that it brought about economic wealth and stability for those who are able to sustain the homesteading for the period of time of five years. So with that, with that overview, yeah, yeah. I'm going to turn it back over to our speaker at the Homestead Monument and turn it back over to Amber. is this stony ground for fruit. My late dad, Kenneth Bender, and I co-wrote a nonfiction book called Still that was published by North Dakota State University Press. Still is an inspiring, sometimes tragic, oftentimes heartwarming account of five generations of a Jewish family, my family, on three continents and my journey to collect, preserve, and share my ancestors' unique stories. Two of the five generations discussed in the book were, as Amber mentioned, homesteading farmers in South Central North Dakota. I'm honored to be speaking at this site of the first homestead in the United States to see this big sky that the first homesteaders, Daniel and August Freeman, Agnes Freeman saw 
to feel the prairie wind that they did, to smell the sweet coumarin fragrance of the grasses of the Great Plains, and to hear the leaves rustling. Those of you with me here in person are experiencing the same historical integrity that I am of this special place. For my family, the subjects being discussed today are far from an academic exercise. It's not overly dramatic for me to state that without the Homestead Act of 1862, I wouldn't be here. My father's family tree would have been entirely felled in Russia. It would only have been a question of when, whether through pogroms that were endorsed by the Russian Tsar in the early 1900s, or if they had stayed during World War II, they would have either been murdered in the towns where they lived in Russia or in concentration camps operated by the Nazis and their Axis cohorts. Having land offered to my ancestors to farm by way of the Homestead Act gave them hope for a future outside of Russia, which ended up saving their lives. So the Homestead effect definitely had a positive ripple effect for my family. I must of course mention that the land that offered freedom and livelihood to my ancestors in North Dakota had been occupied by Native American tribes during some seasons up to until 30 years before my ancestors immigrated. McIntosh County, North Dakota, where my family settled was originally called Buffalo County. The US government broke a series of treaties with the tribes and in the 1870s, the United States Army and hunters engaged in the purposeful slaughter of the bison. These actions together ended the tribe's nomadic way of life and ability to live off the land. They also set the stage for forcing the Native Americans onto reservations to make way for the settlers that the railroads were bringing to the West. 30 years later, in 1906, once the buffalo were gone and the tons of sun bleached buffalo bones that had littered the prairie had long ago been made into fertilizer and bone china, the Jewish settlers, including my ancestors, escaping Russian prosecution, persecution, I'm sorry, came to that same land. I'd like to now provide you with a little of my family background. My ancestors, the Bandersky family, were Jews who became homing, farming homesteaders on the rocky, slopey land near Ashley, North Dakota in 1906. Their German-Russian neighbors called the area where the Jews settled Judenburg or Jewish Hills. But backing up even prior to that, Kiva and Rebecca Bendersky, my great grandparents, were married in the small village of Zebrakov, also known as Hufnungstel, in 1876 in Russia. They worked in Rebecca's parents' winemaking business, picking grapes, stomping grapes, mixing the grape juice with blackberries, bottling it, and bringing it to market before each Sabbath. In 1898, the Bandersky family moved with their children to Odessa, where Kiva, my great-grandfather, became a grain broker. The Bandurskys endured daily persecution by the policies of Russian Tsar Nicholas II, just because they were Jews. There were limits set on education as an example for Jews. It was said the Tsar would prefer empty seats in universities instead of having Jews fill those seats. There were also limits on occupations. As Amber mentioned, Jews were not allowed to lease or own land to farm due to the restrictive May laws that were first instituted by Tsar Nicholas III in 1881. And then those same policies continued with Tsar Nicholas II. Jews were also restricted in terms of where they could live, their travel, their property could be seized with no recourse. They were not allowed to participate in local administrative bodies. 
and their children could be taken as young as 13 years with uh, unfortunately having to serve for 25 years in the Tsar's army. Then came the massacres, the pogroms, the biggest impetus for 2 million Jews immigrating to America from Eastern Europe from the 1880s to the 1920s were the pogroms, the mass murder of Jewish men, women, and children. The pogroms were either carried out by the Russian mobs or the Okhrana, the Tsar's secret police, or the Cossacks, roaming bands of military warriors, oftentimes on horseback with long swords. The Okhrana killed one of my grandfather's brothers and the Cossacks killed another. The Cossacks, the Okhrana, and the mobs were all acting at the urging, directly or indirectly, of the Tsar, both through government-endorsed newspapers and also through Tsar edicts called ukases, blaming the Jews for Russian citizens' poor living conditions, famine, and lack of democratic rights was a concerted effort to divert attention of the masses in Russia away from the failed policies of the Tsar. When my grandfather's only two brothers were killed in 1905, my great-grandfather Kiva said, enough. They made plans to come to America with help from family in New York City and in North Dakota. From Odessa, Russia, the Bandurskis traveled in a wagon covered by a tarp, leaving in the middle of a night of the night. First, they went to Brody in eastern Galicia, then by train to Warsaw, then Berlin, through the Carpathian mountain tunnels, and finally to Antwerp, Belgium, where they thought they were boarding altogether the family that was left there. My great grandparents and my grandfather and his sister, they thought they were leaving for America. Once they presented their tickets to the Red Star Line agent in Antwerp, they were told, oh no, you need more to board this ship. They didn't have any more money to get to America. As my grandfather Yosef was 17 years old at the time, he was still too young to stake his claim under the Homestead Act. So it was decided he and his sister Lena stayed behind at a boarding house in Antwerp until additional money could be sent from family. Can you even imagine how my grandfather at 17 years old felt having just lost his two brothers, being over 2000 miles from his home and waving to his parents who were on the dock heading for America without him. 70 years later, after it occurred, my Hello, everyone. It looks like we've lost our connection with the folks in Beatrice. If you can just be patient for a moment, I am going to try to reestablish. The contract. emblem for Amolam was a plow with the Ten Commandments. 
The emblem signified the right to own and farm land while still being allowed to follow Jewish laws and traditions. As Jews had not been allowed to own land in Russia to farm, the Benders had no experience when they arrived in North Dakota to now make their living off the land. Once in Ashley, North Dakota, Joseph Bender, my grandfather, hired himself out as a farmhand. He learned how to handle a single blade plow with a team of horses, how to break in wild broncos, and also how to seed at the farm of a German production neighbor. He then used these skills once he had his own land. North Dakota Jewish history was unlike that in any other state, as most of the first Jewish settlers in North Dakota came to till the land. About 1,200 Jewish farmers and their families lived in North Dakota on around 250 farms, 86,000 acres, 50 settlements spread out over 27 different counties in North Dakota. This was not continuously, for example, a settlement may not exist from 1880 through 1920s, but it was at various points in time in, within that time period. In the early 1900s, there were more Jewish farmers in North Dakota than anywhere other than three states on the East Coast, New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey. After clearing rocks and boulders, growing wheat and flax, raising cattle and chickens, and selling cream from their sod houses, most of the Jewish homesteaders near Ashley were successful enough to own their own land. The Benders were some of the many Jewish farmers near Ashley in the early 1900s who did not even wait the full five years prescribed under the Homestead Act to take title to their land. They were successful enough that they were purchasing at two or three years after initially staking a claim for their particular land. My grandfather and his sister and parents paid $1.25 an acre. 160 acres or $200. The Benders were proud to produce from the land and to show, as they said, that a Jew could be a successful farmer if given the opportunity. They were forever thankful to America, where a person could practice one's religion and choose one's occupation without fear of persecution or death. Now that you have this little bit of background, I will describe the ways in which the ancestors Looks like we've lost our connection again. Um, I'm afraid this uh, hybrid model is a little frustrating. Um, we're just trying to figure out since we can't all be down in Beatrice today. So uh, I'm gonna try to see if I can reach them. And if we can't get back connected, I apologize for the problems we're having here.
It looks like um, we are not connected. Um, one moment. Okay. Uh, it looks like we um, have lost the connection to Homestead. So um, uh, hopefully they will be able to reestablish it. Um, but in the meantime, I think we should try to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about the situation um, with the Homestead Settlements and see if they can get us back on. Um, it was very interesting to hear Rebecca begin to tell the background of the homesteading situation in North Dakota. Uh, I wanted to add a couple of things of background um, to what she was saying is the colony that her family settled at in Ashley, North Dakota was actually called the uh, Salzburger Colony. It was named after Cyrus L. Salzburger, who was head of the Jewish Agricultural uh, industrial aid society in New York. So this was very much considered to be a project of resettlement uh, out of the point, main points of entry for Russian Jewish immigrants into the New York urban area to resettle people out uh, into the West. Um, the Ashley, North Dakota settlements began in 1904 on government land and not all of the colonies were set up on government land. Uh, and that's an interesting point to consider. Um, and the families initially came out from Minneapolis. One of the very interesting points to consider for those of you who are joining us from Omaha or Denver or Minneapolis or St. Louis is that those four sites were really sites um, where Jewish homesteaders often began from and came back to. So we often see the history of individual homesteaders that they will come out of one of those four communities. Uh, the average homesteading time was a period of two years. Most people did not fulfill the five-year commitment uh, to the government in order to um, gain the, the ownership of the 160-acre tract of land. Um, and then people would return into Jewish communities in um, Omaha, Denver, Minneapolis, or St. Louis. Uh, one of the very interesting things that we have seen of some of the emerging research around homesteading is that when one colony would fail, usually after a period of two or three years, then some of the homesteaders would move from one colony to another. So there's been an attempt by researchers to track these movements of individuals from colony to colony. But that was a pretty small group of people who are making the trek from colony to colony. Most folks were pretty demoralized after working the land for uh, two to three years, two years, and would want to return back to urban areas um, as quickly as they could. One of the very interesting points that um, I, I have seen throughout the research on homesteading is that there was a lot of tension between the individual homesteaders and the aid societies that were providing interest loans at two to 3%, which was in, of course very low uh, for people who did not have access to Jewish loan societies the banks were offering between nine and 12% interest for farm equipment um, to homesteaders. So this kind of low interest rates really did help the Jewish homesteaders quite a bit. Um, but in many cases, the Jewish homesteaders would want to um, have uh, cattle grazers, the, the cattle uh, owners, come and have uh, their land grazed rather than continue to homestead it. And this created quite a bit of tension between the aid societies who had an ideological idea that Jewish farming would create economic independence and stability, and also very importantly, be part of integrating Russian Jews into uh, mainstream society. So um, I know that it looks like we haven't gotten our connection back. And I know many of you who are attending today have family uh, members who did Jewish homestead or know stories about Jewish homesteading that I, I know people are eager to share. Um, 
I want to uh, give people an opportunity to, to talk about some of those comments. I, one thing that I, I did want to add here um, as we try to get back in touch. Oh, I, I have just heard from Beatrice and they said their power went out. <laughs> so um, yeah, we didn't anticipate that, that little glitch, I'm afraid. Um, and they're working on getting us back in. So let's try to hang in there. Um, I, I, I wanted to mention um, that uh, the homesteading experience was really considered to be part of this broader Americanization project. And uh, if you look at the outcome, the final outcome of many people who homesteaded, uh, we can sort of try to address that question as to whether it really did contribute to uh, the process of Americanization or whether it in a sense created Jewish enclaves in farming communities and a greater desire through a process of isolation for people to return to Jewish communities. One of the things I noticed as I was doing work um, looking at particularly this Ashley, North Dakota settlement is that right next to the Jewish settlement in Ashley, North Dakota was a colony of uh, Germans, of uh, uh, Germans who settled from Russia. So uh, that is sort of an interesting dynamic of looking at sort of what the process was of colonies butting up against each other. Uh, so in that case, you had sort of a, a common Russian background with a, a lot of diversity of experience there. Uh, in many cases, the reports from local communities about how they interacted with Jewish homesteaders was fairly positive. Sometimes they were just sort of viewed as the Russians uh, without really viewing it through an anti-Semitic lens. But there are some interesting reports, particularly of early uh, uh, attempts from Cincinnati to set up colonies that when immigrant aid societies would take out groups of settlers, that they would find predatory practices in local communities that they would not sell them farm equipment at normal prices and that they would have to pay incredible prices in order to buy any type of equipment. So um, it looks like the folks in Beatrice are trying to connect us back up. Um, I want to ask if people want to uh, unmute themselves and take this opportunity to ask questions that they have or um, perhaps share a very brief snippet about their own family's uh, Jewish homesteading experiences. So go ahead and feel free to do that. I'll plunge in here. Uh, my grand, my maternal grandmother's family were part of the Cotopaxi settlement in Colorado in the early 80s. But my paternal grandfather, after that settlement failed, and my grandfather married my grandmother, homesteaded on his own in Winter, South Dakota, Gregory County, not as part of any Judy, Jewish settlement thing, and proved up on the land and owned it uh, for 50 years. Just, I, I don't know how many other Jews were in that situation where they, with, as individuals, not as part of a colony, homesteaded. I think that's a very, very interesting point that you raise, um, Richard. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm so excited about your family history and uh, pleased that you shared it with us. Um, the uh, 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 situation of individuals homesteading uh, has not really been clearly documented. As soon as they stopped in like Cayuga, back here. Joseph flew off the train and rammed into the engineer's midsection. After knocking the man down and punching him, Joseph said, have you had enough? The engineer said he had. Joseph helped him up and went into town with the engineer to get a piece of meat to put on the engineer's eye. As they were walking, the engineer said with a degree of admiration, I've never seen a Jew fight. My grandfather again said, well, now you have. Why did my grandfather feel confident stating who he was? Because he was an American. Now, 
I'd like to have a nicer end to that story, but I need to tell you my grandfather was subsequently fired from his job working on the Sioux line because of this incident. But years later, he stated if he had it to do all over again, he would do the same thing. The courage to be honest about who he was passed down to my father's generation. When my dad was interviewing for legal jobs in Minneapolis, when he was about to graduate from the University of Minnesota Law School, he was asked in interviews what church he belonged to. He had the courage to tell the truth. However, when he replied honestly that he was Jewish and attended a synagogue, the interviews ended abruptly. This was the 1930s at a time when my dad, being from South Dakota, was not aware that Minneapolis had a designation as, quote, the anti-Semitic capital of America. My dad ended up accepting a job working for a lawyer in Rapid City, South Dakota. And if he had it to do over again, I'm certain he would say he would still tell the truth about who he was. The fourth type of fruit that came from the homestead land was independence. This independence for my family occurred in two phases. First, on the farm, where the Jewish homesteaders, like all homesteaders, were their own bosses, with all the benefits and challenges that this, this designation brought. There was another type of independence for the Jewish homesteaders, which came from the land, as the great majority of the North Dakota Jewish homesteaders, as mentioned, were successful enough to eventually own their land. The land itself provided a nest egg for the farmers if they chose to sell. There was a large movement off the land in North Dakota in the 1920s and 30s. Jewish farmers were part of this trend, which was not related to anyone's particular religion. In addition to the climatic challenges for all North Dakota farmers, which at the time included a drought, there was a fall in the wheat market and then the depression began. My grandparents did not move to a bigger city when they sold their land. Many of the Bender's fellow Jewish farmers moved closer to cities with larger Jewish populations for their children's education or for their young adult children to have a few more Jewish marriage prospects. The Benders moved only about 30 miles across the border to South Dakota. There they made a down payment to purchase a store in Eureka, South Dakota on its main street. And their store was called Benders Farmers Cash Store. Because Joe Bender, my grandfather had been a farmer, he knew what farmers wanted. So again, having the experience on the land not only gave him the nest egg when he sold the land, but also knowledge to run a successful general store specifically for farmers. My grandparents continued driving from Eureka to celebrate major Jewish holidays with other Jews, and they sent their only two sons for a time to study for their bar mitzvahs like an individual confirmation out of town. But my grandparents enjoyed the rural life and stayed in Eureka, South Dakota, running their general store for over 30 years after they left the farm. Though they were the only Jews in town, their five children all married Jewish spouses and raised their children as Jews, thereby continuing Jewish traditions. The fifth way the land bore fruit was creating a sense of community both within the Jewish community and between the Jews and German Russians who were the predominant population in the area. Some of the stories I learned about these relationships back and forth between these two groups were some of the most heartwarming in all of my research. The friendship between the Jews and their neighbors was based on a dual foundation. First, they felt they were all in this together. When there was the harsh climate, everything from early frosts and prairie fires, tornadoes, grasshoppers, blizzards, when that resulted in crop failures, they all suffered. When the rains and temperatures were favorable, they all triumphed. 
second basis for their friendship was that the Jews and German Russians living in Russia had been friendly with each other there, so moving to America did not change anything. As I mentioned, many of the stories I learned are contained within still about the kindnesses back and forth. I'm going to share with you one of my favorite stories, which was also one of my grandpa Joe's favorite stories as well. An excerpt from Still. In the spring of 1912, Joseph was riding his horse into town. Matthias Kopp, a German-Russian farmer, owned 160 acres near Ashley. Joseph noticed that Mr. Kopp had not seeded his land yet, and it was getting late to plant wheat. He stopped at the cop's house and asked Mr. Cop if anything was wrong. Mr. Cop said his horses were sick. This would be the first year he was not able to plant. Joseph went from farm to farm that evening on horseback, explaining the situation to his Jewish homesteading neighbors. He told them of his plan, that they would all meet at the cop farm the next morning. When Joseph arrived at the cop farm before dawn with his team of horses, plow and seed, he was the only one there. His heart fell. Joseph closed his eyes to concentrate, thinking of the Bible quote from Leviticus as he told the story. In Hebrew, it's Be'ahavta l'reacha kamocha. In English, love your neighbor as yourself. Suddenly, he heard the rumble of horses' hooves, then more horses' hooves, just as the sun started to rise. 30 Jewish homesteaders with 30 teams of horses and 30 plows had come to help their neighbor, Mr. Cock. In one day, they plowed and seeded all of his 160 acres. Mr. Cop came out and looked with disbelief. Why did you do this for me? He asked. Joseph responded, what we did for you, you would have done for any of us. And my grandfather was right. When my great grand uncle, whose name was Israel Arbach, he owned the general store in Ashley, when he would sell staples like flour, sugar, oil, and salt, he sold them a cost to his farmer customers. He also would hold their bills until their crop came in if they were struggling. These practices eventually led the bank to call my great uncle Israel Arbach's loan. The morning Israel appeared at the bank to give them his keys to the store, his non-Jewish German-Russian neighbors, appreciative of his kindnesses over the years, had lined up before he got there to co-sign any note the bankers desired with their own farms as collateral. So their Jewish friend, Israel Arbach, could stay in business. I also learned through my research that the German-Russian farmers near Ashley used to knock on the door of my great-grand aunt Sarah Arbach, Israel's wife, their, their door at all hours of the day and night. The reason? The German-Russian farmers spoke mostly German. They would pick up my aunt Sarah, who was fluent in German and English, with their horses and buggies, and bring her to their homes to translate between their wives, ready to give birth, who spoke only German, and the doctor, who oftentimes only spoke English. Sarah would stay there until the mother was comfortable and the baby was born. Until I gave a talk in North Dakota, I hadn't known the whole story. Three different women of German-Russian ancestry told me that they had ancestors, aunts and great aunts, whose first or middle names were Sarah, named after my Aunt Sarah, a Jewish lady who assisted in bringing their relatives, German-Russian Christian babies, into the world. The sixth result of being homesteaders on the rocky North Dakota land was the ability to help those less fortunate through good deeds. In Yiddish and Hebrew, the word is mitzvahs. So the good feeling of being able to help others to do charitable acts is another one of the fruits of the Homestead Act. 
The following brief story came from a time when my grandparents, Mary and Joseph Bender, were working in old Bender's General Store in Eureka. Here is another excerpt. Bender's General Store became a place where compassion was the norm. When a local family was down on its luck, brown bags of clothes and food appeared on their doorstep anonymously, courtesy of Bender's Store. And there was something else unique about Bender's General. The story is told by a number of sources in and around Eureka, still alive today, of a man who came in to purchase a pair of warm boots. How much are they? The customer asked my grandma Mary, who was waiting on him. She called back to her husband, Joe, working in the back of the store. How much are the boots, Joe? Joe responded, who is it, Mary? Mary told him, and then Joe called back the price. Time and again, if the customer was someone who was struggling financially, the marked price of the goods was lowered significantly. There are numerous examples of my ancestors' good deeds towards those they knew well, hardly knew, or didn't know at all. After my dad was in the army for over five years during World War II, he relocated to Minneapolis. He purchased a store on West Broadway in North Minneapolis uh, with wood floors and high ceilings. It was at that time a federated franchise department store. As his parents had moved to Minneapolis, my dad thought that purchasing the store would be a good temporary investment for him and would give his dad, Joe, who had since moved to Minneapolis as well, a place to mingle with the customers. Well, my dad, Kenneth Bender, ended up working at that store six days a week for 53 years. So, so much for the temporary plan. He provided clothes for the whole family, work boots, shoes, uniforms, bolts of fabric, simplicity patterns, stuffed toys at Christmas time, and of course, parkas, hats, mittens, parkas, hats, mittens. <laughs> I saw my dad in Minneapolis continue doing the good deeds for people who needed good, who needed a little help, just as I had heard that my grandparents had done in Eureka. Once when visiting the store, I saw my dad give a man named Bill a $5 bill out of the cash register, shake hands with him, and the man left. I approached my dad and asked him why he was giving out money instead of taking it in. My dad explained to me that this man had lost his wife, was very depressed, not getting out of his apartment a few blocks from the store. My dad went to talk to him and told him, if you get yourself dressed and leave your apartment and come to the store once a week, I'll give you $5 for a hamburger and a cup of coffee at Bernie's Diner. My dad knew that this man would enjoy the company of the older men who hung out at the diner and said to me with a smile, wouldn't you know it? That was all Bill needed to get out of his apartment and back into life. This story is an example for me of what it means to lead a Jewish life. The seventh type of fruit that came from my ancestors being given the opportunity to farm rocky land was public service. The ability to serve one's community and country, not allowed for Jews in Russia. My grandfather ran for and was elected Ward 2 Alderman in Eureka, South Dakota. He then served as mayor and following that another term as Alderman quite a statement about America and about Eureka, South Dakota. When my grandfather's only brothers were killed in Russia just for being Jewish, in Eureka, my grandfather's religion was totally irrelevant when voters were making a decision about who would best serve their community. My father gave a different type of public service for his country. After graduating from law school and practicing law in Rapid City, South Dakota for a couple of years, 
He was the first volunteer for the Army from his South Dakota county in 1940. He quit his job as a lawyer and volunteered as a private in the infantry on October 16, 1940, the first day of the peacetime draft, the first day that one could register, over one year prior to Pearl Harbor. When my dad was honorably discharged from the service over five years later, he was a major. During that time, he worked his way up from private to captain of Rifle Company B, 2nd Infantry Division, 38th Regiment, leading 200 men onto the beach at Normandy on D-Day plus one, June 7th, 1944. Why did he volunteer prior to any draft? He felt such gratitude for what America had given him, freedom. As is detailed and still, my dad, after 68 straight days of combat, ended up receiving the Silver Star for gallantry in the Normandy invasion, saving his whole company when they were surrounded by Nazis in France. He also received two Purple Stars, Bronze Stars, Combat Infantry Badge, and the Liberty Medal from France. But much more important than any medal was that he was fighting for freedom, for him, for his family, for his community, for America. He never forgot the men he served with who never made it back to enjoy America's freedoms, to have a family and watch them grow. I will never forget a Hebrew school graduation ceremony of my sons, which my dad attended. I could tell my dad was getting very emotional seeing all the students lined up to get their Hebrew school diplomas and hearing all the names being read. I asked him what he was thinking. He said the event was so meaningful and wonderful as if he and his fellow soldiers had not fought, there would be no Hebrew school in America and young Jewish students like his grandson Lincoln would not be allowed to be educated about our religion and traditions. The eighth and final type of fruit I will discuss that came from the homestead land is the offspring of the homesteaders and our stories of things we have accomplished and hope to accomplish after being inspired by our homesteading ancestors. My ancestors' stories have been powerful inspiration for me. Each time I visit the land where my grandparents and great-grandparents homesteaded and see the massive piles of rocks and boulders there, and feel the strong wind blow across the prairie, I realize the enormity of what they did there. As my ancestors moved actual boulders, I have figured that my facing figurative boulders in my life is always much less daunting. When my son Lincoln in 2014 was visiting the Ashley Jewish Homesteader Cemetery with me, he started asking me questions, as young people do, about different subjects. He was asking me specifically more about the Jewish homesteaders. I had some answers, but wanted to know more for myself, for him, and for others who happened by this remote cemetery with Hebrew writing on the monuments. I secretly vowed to get the property on the National Historic Register. When I mentioned my plan to a couple of friends, they said, basically, there are thousands of these little cemeteries all over the Dakotas, all over the Midwest. They're not on the National Register. And they also said, you're not a trained historian, Rebecca. Well, that was all I needed to hear. November 2015, after much research and writing and rewriting the nomination, I made my presentation. The Ashley Jewish Homesteader Cemetery was approved for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. The same feeling that I had in preparing that nomination came over me when I decided to combine my dad's recollections with additional research I had gathered to write the book still. 
I had never written a book, let alone a nonfiction manuscript with 276 footnotes. I'm not a professor, but I knew, again, nothing was going to stop me. I felt a great presence and force with me to continue researching to write this book. I also wanted to inspire people with the stories I had been inspired by and to correct some inaccuracies and stereotypes about Jews farming experiences, which I had run across in my research. I wanted to present the facts to show the truth. Dr. Suzanne Kelly, editor of NDSU Press, North Dakota State University Press, and the editorial board of the same press accepted this nonfiction manuscript from me, a non-historian and non-professor, decided to publish it, for which I'm eternally grateful. And I'm honored to say that still recently won a gold medal Midwest Book Award and a first place independent press award, which is very, both are very humbling. And this optimism and hard work to achieve a goal, I'm proud to say has continued with my son. One example, when we moved back to Eureka, South Dakota in 2013, after my son and I had lived most of our lives in St. Louis Park, a Western suburb of Minneapolis, Lincoln was determined to become the United States Bible champion. He studied via Skype on our computer in Eureka, South Dakota from our town of about 800 people with a wonderful rabbi in Minneapolis, Rabbi Mayor Smith. Again, those in the know told him, you don't have a chance studying from a small town, attending public school instead of a religious day school while playing in the band, and playing on the basketball and baseball teams. Lincoln did not listen to the naysayers. He worked hard and eventually flew to New York City for the competition. After three hours of written testing and two rounds of oral questions for finalists, my son was declared the winner for the 15 years and under bracket and was flown to Israel to participate in the international Bible contest. This land, America, continues to bear fruit for our family. Our strong faith has continued with celebrations and observance of Jewish holidays, bar and bat mitzvahs, Jewish weddings, and Jewish brises and baby namings. We continue to pass down our traditions and our Jewish recipes for prakas, stuffed cabbage, cheese blintzes, strudel, buttermilk fugel, noodle pudding, and humantashen, fruit-filled pastries. And our faith continues to guide us as to how to treat others and provides us joy in happy times and comfort in difficult times. We continue to appreciate that our ancestors climbed down into third-class steerage of the ships to come to America, where we are free and proud to be Americans and Jews. This stony ground was so much more than the 160 acres of dirt and grass. It provided us with freedom, sustenance, courage, independence, a sense of community, the ability to help others and be involved in service to our communities and country. And it provided subsequent generations, including mine, with inspiration because of what our ancestors did on the land. This stony ground bore beautiful. I would now be happy to answer questions and if anyone wishes to purchase books after, here at the Homestead Park, I will happily sign them. I want to let you know a significant amount of the proceeds will go back to the Homestead National Park. I also want to, of course, thank the Homestead National Historical Park, Mark, Amber, Jessica, Amy, Kayla, and staff and volunteers. Also to thank the Schwalb Center for Israel and Jewish Studies at the University of Nebraska Omaha, and the Nebraska Jewish Historical Society for sponsoring this program. Those of you who are on Zoom, if you're interested in learning more about these subjects, 
you also may purchase, happily, I'll tell you, you may <laughs> purchase a copy of Still either by going directly to ndsupress.org and pressing shop now and looking for Still. Um, or you can also, of course, purchase from your whatever your local bookstore or Amazon. So I thank you very much and look forward to answering any questions that anyone may have. Yes, nice gentleman there. Well, it's a good question. The question was asked because I'm not certain if you could hear it. There are a number of Ukrainian <clears throat> and Hutterite colonies in the Dakotas. And the gentleman asked if uh, our family has had any relationships with them. Little sip of water, then I'll answer the question. <laughs> I don't know about anyone prior to my generation, but I can tell you, I worked as a substitute teacher and special ed teacher's aide at a Hutterite colony um, that's near Forbes, North Dakota. Uh, wonderful group of people, wonderful students. Um, and there's a story in the book about, of all things, I was sitting with a Hutterite student whose name is Samuel, and he was practicing his reading at the time, a number of years ago, and had picked a book off the shelf that was Holidays Around the World. And when he got to uh, Hanukkah, which is a Jewish holiday around the same time as Christmas, he said, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. It's Chanukah. And I said, oh, it's pronounced Hanukkah. He said, how do you know that? And I said, because I'm of the Jewish faith. And he was so excited. They read a lot of Bible. And he said, I've never met a Hebrew before. This is so exciting. <laughs> we then started talking about similarities. Um, he asked me, what kind of foods do they eat on Hanukkah, as an example? And I told him, well, a lot is fried in oil for symbolic reasons. Latkes or potato pancakes are oftentimes eaten. He told me the name in German for potato pancakes um, and said, I can't believe we're so much alike. That was a wonderful moment. And um, I felt very welcome there and they were very welcoming to me. And then I have yes. from Zoom, um, Peggy mentioned that uh, she knows of um, Jews that lived in this uh, Pale of Settlement that uh, converted to Catholicism. So they could then um, join the Volga Germans in your research, uh, do you, did you discover any stories of um, World of Germans that had Jewish roots? That is so interesting that you mentioned that. <clears throat> and a number of, oh, and the question should, can they hear your question or should I repeat it, do you think? Um, it was someone on Zoom was asking um, if I ran into any people who were uh, Volga Germans from Germany. Russia, um, who had converted to Catholicism or to other religions, yes, to Christianity. And um, interestingly, this has been happening more and more to me as I give speeches. Someone in the audience will come up to me after and say, do you know what caused me to be here today? And I'll say, no, I'm not certain what caused you to be here. <laughs> and I've heard from a number of people, well, I did that 23 and me, or I did some other testing, genetic testing, and I found out I'm 2% Jewish. And so I wanted to learn more about it. So the fact that um, there are people who were unaware, maybe for safety reasons for their family, they just did not discuss it in different situations, there, more and more people have been approaching me in the last couple of years than uh, previously. So I think more people are doing this genetic testing, finding that they have some Jewish roots and they want to know about all 100% of, of who they are, not just the 97%. <laughs> Let's see. 
Let's see, any other questions? So we have... Well, um, I know that there definitely were Jewish homesteaders in Nebraska. Um, I don't, I did not study it specifically, but uh, that was a homesteading movement as Amber um, well, I'm sure share with us if, if we want to know more about it. It's what brought people from Jews and all backgrounds of people from the East Coast to the Midwest oftentimes. So um, the idea of having your own land, whether they remained homesteaders or like my ancestors, use the land as a nest egg to then go into business. Um, I know that there, it was said in the Dakotas, and I would venture to guess in the Midwest generally, that you could only go about three towns be in this time period of the early 1900s through 1930s. You could only go a few towns over without seeing a Jewish store owner. And they tended to own the general stores. So my guess would be, though I could research it more, but my guess would be that Nebraska was similar to other areas in the Midwest um, and that there were homesteaders who then became business owners and consequently settled here, raised their families here. Let's see, any, oh, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, this, this nice gentleman, a very attentive with his wife for the whole presentation, I must say, uh, he had a question about what did happen to the Jews who did not leave. Um, and I actually did not have that as a focus, but I happened upon some information in researching. I was actually looking at some records from the German from Russia historical societies, and lo and behold, there was reference to um, the fact that I had found out that the town where my grandfather was born, where my great grandparents had their winemaking business, which they always called Zebraco, had this other name, Hafnungstel. And once I knew that there is Hafnungsto, which means Valley of Hope, I, it then opened up a tremendous amount of research that the Germans from Russia had done and Jewish families had done. And um, basically, um, very sadly, there was even an account from an eyewitness when the Romanians came into Hafnungsto during World War II. Um, they rounded up the Jews and there was a young boy who was an eyewitness. And you, you have to give a lot of credit to the German from Russia community for preserving, interviewing him, preserving this history. And I found out sadly that unless Jews were able to be hidden by the German Russians who were there, they were murdered. And it was, it was horrible. And when I read that, I first even wondered, it was so difficult for me that I thought, I don't know if I want to even put this in the book because I thought it might be just too, too difficult for others reading it. But the fact that it was the same town where my grandfather was born, I felt it showed in part how it's just a matter of there, but for the grace of God go I, had they not left. Had he not been killed, uh, his brothers not killed in pogroms and they left, um, they wouldn't have made it out. Similarly, they had moved to Odessa. And I learned as I detail a little bit and still also, no Jews um, in Odessa survived either. So, and we still hear stories about wonderful stories. The 
Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Memorial, it has a list in, in Israel and Jerusalem of what they call righteous Gentiles. And those are people who risk their own lives to save Jewish people. And the stories never cease to give me chills. They're amazing. Um, just recently, I, had, I was explaining some of this to an old friend of mine who actually was a teacher in the Hutterite colony when I was there. And she happens to be German from Russia background too. And, and she said to me something, her name is Minnie. And she said, Rebecca, I have to let you know, if I were in Russia or in Germany, I would have hidden as many Jews as I could. And I said, Minnie, you don't have to tell me that. I know you would. <laughs> yeah. So let's see, is that it for our questions? I'm double checking. I'm doing one more round. Oh, there's sure. Oh, sure. The question was asked about what kind of music when I was growing up did did we enjoy? Well, as part of Jewish festivals, which are called simchas, which just means a happy time. Um, the music can be very upbeat, and there are certain traditional dances that are done. Some are done, they could even call them Israeli dances that are more modern dances. Um, then sort of also one aspect of, of Jewish music um, is oftentimes a, a, the sorrow, the sadness can be felt in minor key melodies. There are many times even prayers and songs we sing in the chant in the synagogue are oftentimes in minor keys. I, I personally wrote um, in still, I wrote a song that actually is entitled still and the lyrics are at the front of the book. And not surprisingly, it's minor key. Um, because that is, I just feel that whenever I hear anything with that sort of um, sort of melancholy sound, it just touches me and it, it brings me back to generations that I didn't even personally know. Thank you. Oh, yes. Okay, I think since they're wrapping up there, I'm gonna shift away here and see if um, folks who are still with us would like to ask any questions or um, have any comments about the presentation or um, you know this very broad topic of Jewish homesteading. Um, for, for those of you who are still here, I, I did want to follow up on Richard's really important point about the lack of research that we have about individual Jews who were homesteading, um, who may not have been going through colonies. Um, and because of the complexity of the patterns of Jewish homesteaders, we really do not yet have a full comprehensive picture of what Jewish homesteading looks like. Um, and so this is uh, really a lot of work yet le left to be done. Um, so with that, I, I wanna open it up to those of you who may um, wanna ask questions or, or make comments We and take a few moments to do that. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, Jeanette, can you hear me? This is yes. Steve Perlman. Go ahead, Steve. I was just wondering if the Industrial Removal Society had very much involvement in bringing Jews to uh, to uh, colonize, uh, resettle uh, out in on the homesteads. Yeah, this is a, a really great um, question. Thank you. Um, the Industrial Removal Office, which we often hear about, the IRO, 
Um, we hear about people making requests to the IRO to resettle um, and, the, and the IRO's involvement in the Galveston project was actually a branch of the Jewish Agricultural Society. So they were actually part of the Jewish Agricultural Society. So it's a, it's a really great question. And researchers have used those archives to try to document individuals. Um, but of course, that is very much dependent on people going to the IRO for assistance. So what we often see um, is- uh, Who actually um, yeah. was from Baltimore, Maryland. When she got married to my grandfather and was living in the sod house, she was the first night she was there after getting married, she was sweeping on the- Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. She's still talking about the sad house there. Um, so it, it's actually a really great question. The problem is, is that people would try to do family reunification through the IRO. So let's say you would go out and start a homestead, and then you would contact the IRO and say, my family is living in New York, and I would like them to join me on the farm. Could you please send train tickets? Um, so we do have some documentation through the IRO papers of that, uh, but it's very um, individual. There's no clear patterns that have been found there, right? Does that make sense? It's yep. individual requests. It's a great, it's a great question, Steve. Thank you. Uh, Peggy, go ahead. Yeah, Jeanette, I just wanted to say thank you so much. It is so wonderful that the Schwab Center did this. And I have, uh, I'm listening this uh, to this here with my mom. And it's so wonderful to learn all this information. I'm excited to learn, like I mentioned in the chat, that our family came earlier from Alsace at the time that uh, France was ceding the Alsace region to Germany and a lot of Jews left so that they would not have to become German citizens because we knew what that would mean for us. So I'm interested to know if there are any programs planned for that, if there's any great research around that. Um, and again, as I mentioned, and I'm kind of proud of this, that our family still owns the home that we homesteaded in Kansas and, uh, and still farm that land. Yeah, those are all really great points. Um, the whole conversion, uh, as, as we all know, the whole situation with documenting the legacy of conversion and then sort of reclaiming experiences is, is complicated uh, because it's really based on sort of individuals finding that information out from their families. There's no kind of collective way that we can document that. Um, though, though sometimes, um, Sometimes conversion records can be found, but it's 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 challenging and unusual to be able to do that. So it's really based on individual narratives. Uh, I'm really intrigued in the idea of of your family still owning the homestead in Kansas and how important it really would be to document um, uh, Jewish families that still do actually own land. Um, this is sort of a critique that's been made that the Jewish homesteaders were, were selling off their land. Um, it's, it's a big critique that was, was being launched by the aid societies. And yet in, in retrospect, perhaps it was very smart to turn the land into capital um, and think about how that uh, helped boost next generations. But equally important is to kind of look at the situations where the legacies of farming continued. Yeah, I would just like to add along those same lines. I mean, it's it's a narrative in our family about the sacrifices that were made to hold on to that land and how important it was to our family to hang on to that and um, and why it's our legacy as a family. And, and he, he acquired more land. Oh, and, then, the and my uncle acquired more land in the area so he can make, you know, firmly establish that our family remains in that area for generations. But my grand Foster. Um, okay. I think we I think we lost Peggy there for a minute. Oh, sorry. My mom was trying to say that um, my grandfather acquired more land. Yeah, he he acquired, that. That's fascinating. Yeah, another ten thousand yeah. acres so that they could they could remain in the area. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I think that speaks to another pattern that I have seen 
which is sometimes when people would sell, they would sell to other Jewish relatives who had adjoining land. Um, so not only do we need a more comprehensive study, which of course I'm working on, of Jewish homesteading as a whole, but also this question of sort of generational patterns um, and movement. So equally important to the homesteading experiences, I would argue, is what happens when people either pass that land onto other relatives or go back into the cities so that we're telling a richer narrative of what the homesteading experience actually meant to a broader Jewish narrative. Okay, are there other uh, anyone else want to jump in with a question or comment before we wrap up? Well, I really appreciate all of your patience today. Um, hybrid is a new format that we're still really working on, and it was pretty experimental with the Beatrice Homestead folks. So thank you very much for all your patience. Um, Please feel free to be in touch with me directly if you want to share further homesteading stories. And um, I assure you that this is a topic that the Schwab Center uh, will be covering more in the future. So thank you all very much and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day.